it have been before, but um, we are reading this uh, 9,000 page volume that thankfully and mercifully has been reduced to 900 pages. Uh, we're only reading the 900 page version, um, but we meet every month and we're reading, um, our reading schedule is like this, so you can see, um, you know, we're doing 100 or more pages a month and then coming and talking about it, but it's pretty informal, it's certainly more informal than this, we get around, we just, we just chat about what um, Philip Pettick was writing. This is, the exegesis wasn't named that by him, it was just this collection of uh, documents that was found in one of, in his garage, um, 9,000 pages, typed uh, diagrams, etc. Um, and uh, it's taken about a decade, or, or some decades, uh, for it to become published, but it was in 2011, and um, it's an incredibly um, labyrinthine, kind of lacunose work. So, you know, if you're interested in, in apprehending it in person, uh, please come along. All right, so um, just comes up. So um, today I will be speaking, as Colin uh, intimated, about psychiatry in Philippe fiction, and particularly one of his novels, um, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. We'll just get the slides up. So my paper's named Doctor Images, uh, Doctors and Their Devices in Philip K. Dick's 1960s novels. It's really only going to be about one novel, but um, I'm sure you'll manage to understand. Okay. So I'll just begin. Um, heralding an initially ecstatic and then a deeply tumultuous decade for science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, the year 1960 inaugurated the beginning of what some critics have called Dick's anti-psychiatric phase, a period in which the sci-fi scrivener began unrelentingly, but always in good humour, satirising the techniques that constituted the emergent mental and psychiatric sciences of his time. Having dropped out of Berkeley in 1947, only one year in, um, objecting to the university's then mandatory military training, Dick was no stranger to the political, or we might say biopolitical, investments and valences intrinsic to the material objects and devices of his time. Um, signifying Dick's alternatively technophobic and consecratory relation to techniques of all kinds is the incident that saw him leave Berkeley. Um, this was a moment in which he refused to reassemble a rifle during military training. So early on, you know, he's rejecting kind of, you know, biopolitical devices, or at least a political device in that context. Um, so Dick laboured throughout his life under the sway of such a disavowingly paranoid relation to objects, uh, engendering an attitude that in his biography indicates what we could describe as a neuro neurotically chiasmic subject position, moving from one parallel to the next. This is a circular or bipolar ontology, an alternation between fetishism for objects and valorization, um, and between fearful and paranoid speculation um, about objects and imminent, and imminent wonderment about the influ influencing power of those artifacts that environed him. So, in this paper, following an outline of um, Dick's 1960s life and a little bit of a digression that I've added in about titles and what I've called um, eponymy, um, uh, I will analyse Dick's non-fictional and fictional engagements with psychiatric technologies of his period, focusing specifically on what's probably his uh, most important novel um, in that time, The Three Stigma of Palmer Eldridge. <coughs> so, a quick note on this novel's title. So like many of Dick's novels, it's a mouthful. Um, however, the seemingly impenetrable and self-indulgent garrulousness of Dick's titles usually serves, in my reading, a very precise function. They generate what Dick himself called a shock of disrecognition. At some point in our reading, the signification of these complicated graphemes becomes clear, coming to rest at a particularised diegetic denotation. Uh, this moment is less resolutory, however, than a shocking instant. While on the one hand, suddenly everything fits. All the blurry edges are now in sharp relief, 
and we can metabolize the title unproblematically. On the other hand, the revelation or discovery of some semantic definition nudges at the narrative center of gravity, shifting what could be described as its metavalence, or in more Cartesian terms, its essential substance. So that's why the book is called that, we might say, as we read it. Um, but the process is more complex than simply a resolution. At this punctum, or kairos moment, that kind of epiphany, um, occurring at the level of the act of reading, we feel not only rewarded for having done the work for reading it, um, now knowing the secret knowledge available only to initiates, we also experience a virtualization of what Deleuze and Guattari uh, once called an ambulant science, a process by which, like scrubbing a dirty pot clean, um, eventually exposing kind of a silver clean surface or polishing a diamond, uh, revealing you know, clean up distinctions of its facets. It's through reading, which I'm calling an ambulation, like a scrubbing clean of the text or um, a kind of ambulation through it, walking through it, that we come to understand it on its own terms. Ambulant science is, uh, Deleuze and Guattari say, like Bergson's idea of intuition, uh, rather than intelligence, which is kind of more like the royal science, the empirical science that we know. Um, they speak of this ambulant science in their book, A Thousand Plateaus, but they also allude to it in their final book, Deleuze and Guattari's final book, uh, What is Philosophy, their final collaborative book, in 1991, before Guattari died in 92. There, the authors, authors spoke of ambulant science in the context of answering their eponymous question of that work, what is philosophy? And reenacting that ambulation today, as you are witnessing, um, I want to suggest that Dick's novels, in this minor technical way, this relation of the title and the work we do, the legwork we do by reading them, um, it is something significant, however simple a phenomenon it seems. Um, it has something to do with. Um, the process of naming and recognizing something as already named, uh, that which is revealed by the ambulative process itself. So if royal, as Deleuze and Guattari call it, or metrical science or uh, empirical science um, formulates models, names, diagrams, and so on, then the location, the presence, or the phenomenological existence of the things that are named um, have to happen through, intu through intuitive means, through messy experimentation. So, akin to this distinction, and I told you this was a bit of a digression, but we'll get on to the psychiatrist um, is the search for the Higgs boson, um, which some of you may know of, at the CERN Hadron Colliders. The Higgs has already been named, it's already been formulated, it's already been modeled, and um, by, by the theorist, uh, uh, Higgs himself. In fact, it's eponymously named. Um, but what exactly the model intuits, and whether the substance refers, whether it exists, whether the substance of the name refers to exists, can only be experimentally discovered through ambulation, invariably carried out by persons who are unnamed as such. So, as in the naming of particles in theoretical physics, where denotations specify a genealogical trajectory of ambulation and intuition, a history of scientific theorization, Myriad things are interesting about the tactic by which Dick gives seemingly complicated or theory-laden names to his fiction. Consider, do, some, uh, do androids dream of electric sheep? Um, we can remember it for you wholesale, or flow my tears, the policeman said. These, are, that, that these titles are too complicated, uh, that, that they limit tradition in which alterity is produced through abundance or excess, something like what Borges does. Um, is evident in their renaming uh, by Hollywood in the titles we see here, Blade Runner, Total Recall, and interestingly this is a quote, but you know, Dick must uh, say more than the quote, he must uh, exceed the quote, producing this kind of you know, complication. Uh, in the title, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, the reference to the three stigmata denotes the particularised attributes of the eponymous character, Palmer Eldridge. Uh, we have his vidlux eyes, his steel jaw, and his mechanical hand. So his body is a post-human one. Uh, where am I? Sorry. Reconstituted by an array of technical enhancements. However, characters in the novel only see Eldritch's three stigmata. They only actually see these parts of his body when they are under the influence of a drug that he himself has manufactured, a drug named Chu Z. 
the cover of the first edition of the novel assembles these three stigmata into an ensemble of metonymic cutouts, recalling modern, the modernist posters of Saul Bass. So eponymity, as I have already alluded to, is interesting in its own right. As we know, most eponymous novels name the protagonist. Um, this novel's eponym, however, Palmer Eldridge, refers to its villain, what could be called the novel's antagonist. After all, it is Eldritch's, it's Eldritch who provides the drug in the text, the drugs in the text. So we're hewing the glossary of psychopharmacology here when we say he's an antagonist. His antagonism is performed as a biochemical operation. Uh, it's a dopaminergic or serotonergic antagonism which causes hallucinations. So like, for example, the title of L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz or even Moby Dick, the eponymic operation invests not uh, meaning in the protagonist, but in an er mythical figure, a presence whose existence, whose personality can only be understood experimentally through ambulation by following a yellow brick road or by taking an experimental drug. Outside the text, reading is our ambulation. We follow Dorothy along the road. We follow the protagonist of Stigmata, a guy named Barney Mason, into his hallucinations. We take the drug. So, like the Wizard of Oz himself, and like Moby Dick, Palmer Eldritch is a chimerical being whose very existence is indeterminable, or at least virtual. Like the uncertainty of the wizard's talents in Wizard of Oz, the question of whether Eldritch's hallucinations actually exist becomes the central inquiry of the novel. The book is in this way a meditation on the possibility of a placebo effect. Did the drug work, or is it just my imagination? Um, it's a meditation on the notion of what is now described as hallucinogen persistent, persisting perceptual or perception disorder under the DSM-5, um, which is this continuance of hallucinations after a drug's biochemical operation has ceased, um, as if a trace may exist either in reality or, uh, you know, in the imagination. So this is the kind of idea that Dick once described as the world being only apparently real and um, Paul Williams who collected all the exegesis in boxes from Dick's garage um, calls his biography of Dick that only apparently real so like the wizardry of the Wizard of Oz and you can remember the film here if you like um, this is a methodology that as we know the wizardry is a methodology that's revealed only to be a complicated manipulation of techniques, you know, behind the curtain, uh, moving things around, pulling levers. Um, it's not actually a metaphysical sorcery or, or some, some theistic deity doing a miracle. Um, so we're, we're in the same position when we're looking at Palmer Eldritch in this novel. Are the drugs working still? Are they still going, coursing through our blood, crossing our blood-brain barrier? Or is this a flashback? Is this an hallucination that will never stop? And finally, just on this initial digression. So, I mean, the other thing that we want to think about with this title is stigmata itself. I mean, just as Jesus' crucifixion wounds are supposed to confirm his resurrection, his stigmata, uh, the evidential traces of his death, I mean, this is, this is the confirmation of the miracle, the traces themselves, uh, the continuation uh, Eldritch's stigmata, the jaw, the eyes, and the mechanical hand, uh, signal the continuation of the neuromolecular operations of the drug. It's only when you see these kind of mechanical implements uh, that you know that you're still experiencing a, an hallucination. So the central question of the novel is, if the hallucinal images go away, if the hallucinations disappear, and then they reappear, does this confirm the resurrection, as it were, of the psychoactive compound in the brain? Or, or is it merely a memento mori of the original trauma, a deja vu with flashback, however you want to describe it? So of course the same question Dorothy has to face when she wakes up, you know, was it all a dream or it was all the dream? Um, psychopharmacological substances in the form of tablets, drugs, medicaments, what Jamison calls a juvence, um, and the like are in psychi psychi psychiatry's history the end game of uh, what is generally a very mechanistic science. I mean, molecularization or the turn to biochemistry took place at around the time that Dick was writing this in the 60s. 
um, and molecularization. Fancy word. Nicholas Rose, who's a kind of biopolitics scholar, and even Felix Guattari uh, used that term to refer to this 1960s turn towards the human, understood as a you know, field of molecular manipulations. So Dick's really zoning in on that from a very early stage um, in its history, in the history of psychiatry. Oh yeah, and there is my slide for equanimity. I don't know if I put that up already, but I thought this was a you know, very amusing coincidence to see uh, Peter Higgs here, the face of the Higgs boson appearing between the curtains as if the Wizard of Oz himself. Um, so, in 1959, Dick had recently married his third wife, Anne Rubenstein, uh, a widow who had been caring for her three children following the death of her husband, the Jewish poet Richard Rubenstein. Dick and Anne were brought together by a shared love for writing and a love for the accoutrements that befitted a literary life. There they are. Although Dick had never been quite settled in the literary kind of milieu as a sci-fi writer, you know, sci-fi then as now is a weirdo genre in a way, um, Dick could never have channeled the Elan of the Bloom's Reset, for example, um, such as Anne's former husband, Rubenstein, might have done. However, while Dick had laboriously collected and continued to pour over his rich store of science fiction through his early years, collected from his childhood in the 40s, uh, his prized possessions were few and could be housed in a small room, consisting most notably of his Magnavox Hi-Fi, his filing cabinet of sci-fi magazines and his collection of records. Dick, while married to Anne, did in fact store these few, few of his possessions in a small room. Um, it was a place a kilometer's distance from his house that he named the hovel. Um, the hovel served two purposes for Dick. It was the engine room uh, for his fiction. He would go there, uh, do a lot of methamphetamine, and uh, produce 68 final, uh, final pages of copy a day, in his words, um, while supercharged on these heroic doses of drugs and cognate others. As he said in an interview of a decade later, his writing fell into two degrees, writing under the influence of drugs and writing that didn't uh, come under the influence of drugs. For years, as Dick continues, he had to take amphetamines in order to write so much since the pay rates were so low. It's kind of like an economic logic. Um, in f yeah, that's why. In five years, Dick says he wrote 16 novels, which is incredible, this is his own words. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody's done that before, and I, I think he's right. Um, 16, what's it, 16 novels in five years, all published. Um, <laughs> sure some have done it and not haven't published. Less heroically, the hovel also became, as Anne Phil's marriage fell through, a place for Dick not only to produce novels that provided a source of income for his new family, but also to hide from the responsibilities entailed by his new role as a father, which he tragically came to resent. Um, in the same interview that I was quoting earlier, published in SFI in 1996, conducted in 77, uh, 1996, Dick describes how he felt forced to use amphetamines in the context of the expense of the increasing accumulation of objects in his life, reproving what he regarded as Anne, his wife's improvident materialism. I was supporting, he said at one time, four children and a wife with very expensive tastes, like she bought a Jaguar and so forth. I just had to write, and that's the only way I could do it. So his drug use was clearly nothing to do with his own drives. Um, reading various of the biographies about Dick, including Anne's own, throws into relief the extent to which it was while married to Anne, uh, a jewellery designer and trader, uh, that uh, Dick began to invest more in making these serious purchases, the Jaguar and so forth. It's true. A beautiful Jaguar for the family, Barbie dolls and all the latest toys for uh, his girls, and a range of expensive objects for the house, including rare books. However, Dick's insistence that Anne yearned for the Jaguar is somewhat undermined by the opening passages in one of his novels um, called We Can Build You, uh, where Louis, Louis Rosen, the protagonist, lovingly describes the Jaguar as, I will quote, um, as, as well as the moderate $2,000 price tag, uh, which is roughly 15 grand in today's money, as, as this. So this is in We Can Build You. The Mark 7 Saloon model Jaguar is an ancient huge white car, a collector's item with fog lights, a grill like the rolls, and naturally hand-rubbed walnut leather seats, and many interior lights, and so on and so forth. I mean, this 
puts paid to the argument that it was really Anne's choice to buy it. I mean, here we have Dean kind of channeling his love for the car um, in his work. So, but whether we read this as Dick's own voice or his commendable impersonation of an admiring other, his, of Anne, it is difficult to, not, to deny Dick's textual investment in detailing the car here, uh, which has a textual libidinal blaze on, uh, is riven with, some, riven with authorial jouissance. Um, it becomes a means of consecrating and sacralizing the object, the Jaguar, investing it with some kind of novelistic magic. Gleeful that Anne had permitted him to grow a beard, Dick imagined himself in the initial years of his marriage as the domesticated, rather lazy and intellectual novelist, novelist of California's North Coast. And in 63, the year of their marriage, Dick and Anne symbolically mourned the death of Aldous Huxley, and uh, an intellectual that they both admired, whom they both admired, almost as much as they admired John F. Kennedy, who died on the same day, along with C.S. Lewis. Uh, describing Dick's 63 to 66 period as his family man period, or masterpiece years, biographers and self-proclaimed dickheads, which is to answer Colin's question of what do you call someone who likes Dick um, earlier, uh, have only half acknowledged the extent to which the trauma of Dick's childhood remained even while he was happily for a time ever present. He was always uh, traumatized by his early childhood. Fermenting a suspicion that would form the basis of Dick's derisive and defiant characterizations of psychiatrists through the 60s. In 1977, Dick told interviewers of how an experience in his early life nourished a distrust of psychiatry. Uh, sorry, if my PowerPoint's are a bit out of order today. Uh, wondering if our value system, what was right and wrong, were absolutely true or merely culturally relativistic, as he put it, Dick's speculation was diagnosed as a symptom of his neurosis by a psychiatrist when he was of a young age. In response, the 20-year-old Dick found a copy of Nature, the science journal, British science journal, um, where he learned that, quote, in his words, virtually all of our values are derived essentially from the Bible and cannot be empirically verified. Here I was, Dick says, a teenager in the 40s, and here he was, a psychiatrist. Now I look back and I see that this man was cemented in a simplistic mode. I mean, his brain was dead as far as I could determine. This is how Dick speaks of psychiatrists in his, as a 20-year-old. And um, it's in response to his having been diagnosed with a neurotic personality disorder simply because he questioned kind of, you know, the basis of science. He, he basically says, you know, psychiatric uh, uh, knowledge is, is only only is kind of you know verifiable as, as biblical knowledge. So, Dr. Smile, which is the name of the portable psychiatric computer in the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, shares something of this brain dead quality uh, that, we, that Dick imputes to the psychiatrist in its automated and unimaginative diagnosis of Barney Mason, our novel's protagonist. Connected by micro relay to a mainframe computer, Located, perhaps in a Freudian symbolic way, uh, to the basement of, of uh, Barney Mason's pub. The psychiatric suitcase, as Dick Novels calls it, uh, this is in 1960s, you know, well before laptops, so we've got a psychiatric suitcase. Um, you open it and the face appears and says, How are you today? It's a bit like Siri or something. Uh, is a metonym. This is a metonym for the infinitude of wisdom signaled by the vast cybernetic information database that undergirds it. So it's connected to the basement, the supercomputer in the basement. It knows everything you're doing, it knows everything about you. Maintaining a dispersed and multiplicitous presence throughout the novel, Dr. Smile, we learn, can be in more than one place at one time, enabling the machine to intercept, transmit, and even report back on its patients' conversations and treatments. As a kind of spy that psychoanalyzed me, Dr. Smile is portable property that surveils and monitors the patient every bit as much as it purports to treat them. An almost pathetically obvious prolepsis of the internet, or the smartphone, and more specifically the emergence of what we now sometimes know as e-therapy, you know, online psychotherapy, um, which has recently popularised in Lisa Kudrow's kind of web TV show called Web Therapy, I'm not sure if anyone's seen it. Um, Dr. Smile is also, more locally, a condensation of the various devices that emerged while Dick was actually typing up his manus manuscript for Three Stigmata. While there were no laptops or anything, there certainly were like machines to psychotherapize, uh, psychotherapize him. And, um, and let's have a look at those. So, in the arcade and computer laboratories of 1963, MIT, 
Uh, Joseph Wintenbaum's ELISA machine provided a mechanical parody of a non-directional psychotherapist in an initial psychiatric interview. So, I mean, it's already a parody, but it is doing the work of uh, a psychiatric machine as well. In the years following, more of these so-called chatterbots would appear, including a parry, a computer-simulated paranoid schizophrenic human. A few decades earlier, in the 1930s, chiropractor Volney Matheson, the writer of such techno-fictional short stories as A Phony Phone, and then later The Radio Buster, uh, and perhaps predictably in view of his interest in technology and chiropractic diagnosis, invented what he called, bewilderingly, that's right, the electroencephaloneuromentomograph, um, a variation and as a variation on the Wheatstone Bridge devices invented a century earlier, which are these galvanic kind of uh, you know things that you hold and it gives you a reading and you're meant to know how anxious you are. Uh, Matheson simplified the name of what was essentially his ohm meter, uh, which measures electrical resistance, to the Matheson electropsychometer, which he used to investigate his patient's health. And there he is. Um, with one on the couch and hooked up to the machine. So by the late 1950s, after some patient rights disputation with the Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, with whom Matheson had long collaborated, Hubbard painted, patented his own uh, battery-powered electropsychometer in 1966. He called it the Hubbard E-meter, um, which some of you will be familiar with. Um, while Matheson was how familiar, I'm not sure. Some of you may be Scientologists. Uh, no, no disclosure necessary. Um, but uh, so he painted it his own. And um, while Matheson decried in words that echoed his description of uh, his novel, The Phony Phone, that he imagined uh, the device earlier and that he rejected uh, the doings of trivial fakers such as Scientologists who glibly denounce hypnosis and then try covertly to use it in their phony systems, unquote. Matheson rejected Hubbard's device and uh, felt defrauded, uh, and then, uh, Math uh, that uh, Hubbard had stolen his idea and made it commercial, uh, you know, put it to a commercial success, which in fact he very much did. So it is before this spuriously techno-scientific background that Dick not only imagines the suitcase psychiatrist of Three Stigmata, Dr. Smile, but had also acerbically and unsubtly imagined in his 1954 short story, The Turning Wheel, a device used by a group known as the Faithful Bards. So I'll just hold that for a minute. Obviously, this is the E-meter today, and that's Hubbard using his E-meter in the 50s. This is, you can go to your Scientology, local Scientology place and, and, and try one out, see if it works. And there's the agreement up the top between Matheson and, um, and Hubbard. So it's not Hubbard's invention. I mean, Hubbard... Uh, just took an existing technology and implemented it and called it a religion. No offense. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, Dick responds to this not only in the Three Sigmata, but then he writes this uh, interesting short story called The Turning Wheel, where a device, as I was saying, used by a group known as the Faithful Bards, uh, followers of their leader, who is named L. Ron Hugh. So if you put that together, L. Ron Hugh and the Bards. Um, to anticipate their futures and to assess the clearness of their conduct. And if anyone's familiar with Scientology, I mean, that's the whole point. You hold onto these, uh, to, you know, onto these uh, kind of galvanized uh, implements, bars, and you're meant to get no reading, to, to get rid of body thetans, okay? And um, there's a whole history to it. <laughs> Science fiction. Um, but in any case, it obviously, this short story is none too subtle a satirization of Hubbard's Dianetics. Um, and the turning wheel responds to the publication of an article that signaled the Bard's, or on Hubbard's, pseudoscientific turn in 1950, which was called a serious piece, or a fact article, by uh, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction, John W. Campbell. And this uh, article, uh, which was called Dianetics, the Evolution of a Science, graced the otherwise very unserious and charmingly illustrated pages of Astounding Science Fiction, a magazine that Dick, the avid pulp now collector, had doubtless bought and read. So this is the first time that Dianetics, which became Scientology, is proposed, and it's in Astounding Science Fiction. 
Um, and uh, in that article, it's quite interesting. They get, you know, Hubbard proposes the whole theory of aliens in the in the body that we must uh, expunge and so forth. So Dick finds this incredibly, um, you know, uh, useful for his satirical science fiction purposes. But if the turning wheel represents Dick's hokey satirization of the proselytizing influence of the technical devices wielded by religio pseudoscientists like Hubbard and his dianeticians, then the three stick mother of Palmer Eldritch offers us a grown up version of Dick's critical or anti psychiatry, taking on the atomization of the subject into symptoms in a more serious manner. It may be laughable that the anxiety that Dr. Smile monitors in his patients are measured in Freud's. That's the kind of metric of their stress. How many Freud's are you? Um, it, <laughs> but it is rather more sobering that Dr. Smile participates as a functionary in the broader biopolitical regime, monitoring, surveilling, and sedating uh, those that uh, inhabit an inclement earth in the three stigmata uh, in this circa 2016 world. There may be one way to sidestep the seemingly inex in inexorable deportation to a Martian hovel, which is what all the citizens in the three stigmata of Father Eldridge and Malfoy have to do. They, have to, they're, they're either, they stay on Earth and they're psychoanalyzed by this machine, or they can flee to Mars and take the drug. A bit like, you know, the Matrix, two drugs, no other option. Um, so that we can possibly uh, avoid the deportation. Um, and this is when we uh, go under the influence of the hallucinogen choosy that I referred to earlier, or another one, Candy, uh, among our own hovel. Um, with a population of dirt farmers. <clears throat> and while you uh, use the drug Choosy or Candy, you play with the Barbie dolls, Barbie doll set, and you actually enter the bodies of these Barbie dolls. Um, there are only two actually, Perky Pat and Walt Essex. You become either a male or a female, and you live out a 1950s idyllic life. Take the drug, play with the dolls, etc. Obviously Dick was watching his children play with dolls and uh, had these kinds of ideas. So, I mean, this is a biopolitical future that, that Dick's foreseen back in the 1960s, where you take a drug and you play a kind of game. Um, this is well before computer games, well before uh, anything like that. So, um, to escape the biochemical bio regime, one might, however, only need to make an appointment with another person altogether, uh, and if one can afford it. And here's, here we get the real psychiatrist, the real evil psychiatrist of the novel. Um, and this is to receive e-therapy at the hands of Dr. Denkmore in his Eichenwall Clinic in Munich. A man who Richard Hatt, one of the other characters in the novel, um, describes as a small, round style of middle-class German with white hair and an ouch white some moustache. Just as Dick's Dr. Smile operates as an imaginary and symbolic condensation of those other devices I've looked at, the Eliza, Harry, and the E-meter, and programmatic psychotherapy in general. Denkmal, this other character that we see, who looks like Albert Schweitzer, condenses a range of images that profoundly and impactfully signify the reductivism and malediction of psychotherapeutic medicine. So I'll explain that. The fact that Denkmal wears an Albert Schweitzer moustache and speaks of his bubble-headed patients as very evolved, both spiritually and physically, after they undergo therapy, their heads grow, reminds us of a theologian physician Oh, reminds us that the theologian physician Schweitzer was actually preoccupied with finding a lucid nexus between science and theology and that was emblematized in his PhD thesis which was titled The Psychiatric Study of Jesus in which he proposed a method of diagnosis at a distance um, of actual psychopathy in Christ so Schweitzer proposed that Jesus Christ again, no blasphemy for those who are um, religious was, was psychopathic, and he set out to do this uh, from a physician's perspective and a theologian's perspective in his PhD, and, then, and it was then published uh, some years later. So e-therapy is the ideal adjunct for a person such as Schweitzer, for would-be theologians and physicians. Uh, better than Candy, the drug's uh, re-enchantment of a mysterious divine world where we play games, um, e-therapy technologically enables us to resolve spiritual conflict if only Luther and Erasmus were alive today, says Dr. Denkmal, the one who inflicts or 
uh, provides e-therapy. Their controversies could be solved easily now by means of e-therapy. Dankmore's Germanness, inflected in his every ascendetic utterance, recalls the protean stereotype of the mad scientist, whose prototypes included not only Faust's alchemists and enchanters, who were in league with the devil, or Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein, who was Genovese, not German, but anyway, um, but also, of course, the post-World War II instantiations of the mad scientists, frequently modelled on the Nazi brain doctor, Joseph Mengel. Um, German for monument, this is the name Denkmal, itself coming from the Latin monia, to remind. Denkmal's name also sounds a shadowy echo of the human mental and physical experiments that occurred under the Third Reich, where mescaline testing and other shock treatments, such as the notorious aviation experiments at Dachau, sought to remind, as, as in to remake the minds, uh, of all, of, all, all those who suffered there. Uh, splitting it up, the German Denken means to think, and Mal, which we probably know from a grand mal seizure, uh, means sickness or harm, connotes the fact that Denkmal's e-therapy threatens to generate a, a seizure and a shock in, in his patients. Dr. Denkmal, mind shock. Um, Denkmal's e-therapy threatens to, uh, feeling, sorry, excuse me, uh, feeling in his words, in his words, the patient's words, like a hog-tied animal. Richard Knapp, one of our protagonists, experiences e-therapy as an animal, as a pig. And as such, uh, it recalls the historical origin of ECT, of electroconvulsive therapy, which was the first shock therapy to use electricity, um, adapted by two Italian psychiatrists, Ugo Cioletti and a colleague, in fact, from the techniques that he and his physician friend, Gaetano Vial, witnessed in a municipal slaughterhouse. So they actually went to a slaughterhouse, saw the pigs were being shot with this implement, early 1940s psychiatrist, and said, hey, that's, a, that's something we could use. Um, so yeah, electricity was used to stun pigs. And from that device, we get the early instantiations of shock therapy. So in post-World War II, the Rome University Psychiatric, Psychiatry Clinic became an experimental hub for shock treatment, and by the 50s, its practice had become widespread throughout the US. So e-therapy by Dr. Denkmal has all of these kind of you know, connotations and associations in, in Dick's work, and he's really engaging with the history of psychiatry. All right, just about finished now. So, the fact that Dr. Denkmal's e-therapy is deployed not to sedate his patients, but to stimulate what is called in the novel the Cressy's gland, causing them to evolve, to you know, become enhanced, both physically and mentally, indicates Dick's awareness of what I'll call the pharmaconic nature of medical procedures and devices. The fact that medicine, like the speech and language acts that Derrida identifies in Plato's Phaedrus, um, can either kill or cure, uh, is relevant here. The three stigma of Palmer Eldridge, in fact, gives us a more specific example of the pharmacon in the diametrical responses that we see to e-therapy, experienced by Richard Knapp and his wife, Emily Knapp, who are closely modelled on Dick and Anne. Emily, well, while Richard reaches new orders of conception uh, after the shock treatment, experiencing new lightning leaps of intuition, and Emily, on the other hand, who is a ceramic artisan by trade, contrastingly regresses to a prior subjective state, producing the same ceramic pot over and over again. And just recall that Anne, his wife, was a jeweller at the time. So the bipolar plights of Emily and Richard, one becoming enhanced by this therapy, the other becoming kind of, you know, repetitive, um, closely parallels Dick's and Anne's diametrical reactions to uh, the phenothiazine class antipsychotic drug that they actually both used in the 60s called Stelazine, which Anne had been ordered to take following her brief psychiatric institutionalization. And this took place seemingly under Dick's uh, instructions. And in the couple's last married year, um, Dick borrowed the drugs, or took the drugs from that and started to use the antipsychotics experimentally. And in her memoir, 
and identifies herself as the figure upon whom Emily Knapp from The Three Stigmata is based. And by her own and other biographers' accounts, Stelazine turned her into a zombie. On the other hand, Phil felt great benefits from the antipsychotic, expressing to his neighbour, June Pressey, um, how good it made him feel. Now, recall that uh, the gland upon which the e-therapy functioned was called the Cressy's gland. I mean, so the dots all come together here. Dick uses his real life to critique psychiatry. Um, yeah, so this psychobiological or psychobiographical work is even more fortified recalling that Denkmal's e-therapy was supposed to stimulate the Cressy's gland. And this is a brain region that Dick invents named after his neighbour, uh, the very person whom he told uh, the antipsychotics worked and functioned well. So that, that kind of, I think that neighbour was his kind of consultative psychologist as he experimented with all of those stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so to conclude, Dick's engagement with a range of devices, of which I've offered only the most miniature snapshots today, presages what is today described in contemporary philosophy of psychiatry as the field's emerging device paradigm. De desiccating the, the episteme of Hippocratic or Gallian medicine, the device paradigm is criticized by philosophers of psychiatry for instituting and performing an impersonal mode of technical reason. Does the drug work? Yes, well then your disorder is cured. Don't talk to me anymore. Um, and this technical reason atomizes or molecularizes the subject, um, subordinating the question of subjective identity or phenomenology, and it prioritizes um, surveillance, really, looking across a checklist of demonstrable symptoms. So it has been proposed that Dick was influenced by the anti-psychiatric movement that consisted of thinkers as diverse as R.D. Lang, Felix Guattari, Foucault, and Irving Goffman, and the extreme one, Thomas Sass. Um, however, it was Dick's personal acquaintance with psychiatric, treat psychiatric treatments, very personal, um, its drugs, doctors and psychopathologies that enabled many of his novels to function as Roman A. Clef, um, a novel with a key that tells us something about the author, where objects around him were fictionalised as the very techniques that defined and regulated him as a real-world biopolitical subject. Okay, thank you very much for your attention today.